Today, we have the great pleasure of listening to the work in progress by one of our very own professors. And I'm so pleased to introduce Professor Brian Meeks, who until recently served as chair of our Department of Africana Studies and the Rights and Reason Theater. Professor Meeks came to us from several important positions across the world. First, the University of the West Indies in Jamaica, but also at the University in Suriname, which used to be part of the Dutch empire. Uh, he's also taught at Michigan State and at Stanford and at Cambridge. So Professor Meeks has published uh, extensively and widely and is a very active scholar on Caribbean political thought and Caribbean revolutionary movements. His forthcoming book, I think we're all looking forward to, Professor Meeks, has this fabulous title, After the Post-Colonial Caribbean, Memory, Imagination, Hope, that will come out next year. So without much ado, let's welcome Professor Brian Meeks, who is going to talk about something I think very special to him personally, but also to the larger field of research he has been conducted, conducting on Caribbean uh, political thought and activism. The title of his talk this afternoon is Hiding in Plain Sight, Tito P. Achong, Race and Anti-Colonialism in Wartime Trinidad. It's on the PowerPoint that will accompany Professor Meeks' talk. Professor Meeks, please. Thanks, uh, Professor Evelyn Q. Duhart for that um, too generous introduction. And um, I want to also thank um, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at Brown, uh, Director Patsy Lewis, Kate Goldman, Emily Rubelman for putting this together uh, for me. Um, I, I don't have a screen that tells me who is uh, listening in, but I do suspect one or two family members have tuned in from across the world. Um, if, if any of my aunts, Lilia Puntip or Diana Carmichael are here, um, I want to give a special shout out to them. And you'll see why in a moment or two. And anybody else, um, uh, welcome on board. Um, the title of my talk, as I've said before, is Hiding in Plain Sight, Tito Piachong, Race and Anti-Colonialism in Wartime. Trinidad, and I'll get right into it. On February 17, 1943, Mayor of Port of Spain in the colony of Trinidad and Tobago, Tito Princiliano Achong received visiting representative of the British Council, Harold Stannard, in his offices at the town hall. What should have been a requisite and polite meet and greet from a col colonial official breezing through the West Indies turned out, however, to be quite something else. In chapter four of his later to be published, Mayor's Annual Report, 1942 to 43, and under the jolting title, Peripatetic Propagandist of British Culture, Achon captured the cut and thrust of an encounter between the patronizing and self-congratulatory official and himself. Stannard in discussing methods of university instruction underlines his authority by letting it drop that he was an Oxford University man with all the impl implications of confirmed superiority. He's taken aback, however, when Achang blithely contrasts Stannard's assertions with what he considered as the superior methods of instruction at Harvard University. Achang writes, quote, he asked me whether I had studied at Harvard and I had no option but to reply in the affirmative, unquote. My shock at this assertion of credential equality leads to dismay when Achong confronts him with what was then a burning question in Trinidad. 
as to whether government should make subventions to the established and upper class schools of religious dominations while refusing to assist others founded by natives, quote, even though equally worthy, unquote. Stannard reply provides no answer. And Achan continues, quote, I then braced myself up for direct action. We next swap brief stories on culture. I told him in as clear a manner as I could that his notion of a cloistered culture for the Trinidad community must be ruled out as a paradox. Achong then continues to comment that the component ethnicities of Trinidad have cultures that long predated William the Conqueror's landing in England in 1066. They did not require British propaganda culture to remind them of their own greatness. Dismay had by the end of this phase of the conversation yielded to consternation. And here once again are Achang's words, quote, this was too much for the British Council's professional propagandist. He stood up, salaamed in old time oriental fashion and departed, unquote. Reporting on his visit afterward in a daily paper, Stannard announced that he had been well received by all and sundry, and that the only fellow who did not give him a good reception was the mayor of Port of Spain. Here in miniatures captured the totality of Tito Achang, erudite, intellectually self-confident to the point of arrogance, uncompromisingly anti-racist and viscerally anti-colonial. This two-term period as mayor of Port of Spain, 1942 to three, 41 to three rather, however, was the high point of his career. After leaving office in 1943, he would continue writing in the papers for another decade. Then just as the burgeoning post-war nationalist movement began to gather steam and under Eric Williams and his People's National Movement, rising to power in 1946 and leading 56 and leading the country into independence in 1962, Achang withdrew from politics and faded from both popular and historical memory. One of the strands which this study hopes to answer, though not today, is what were the factors that led to Achan's withdrawal? And equally importantly, why is he hiding in plain sight in the archives of Trinidad and Tobago's history? By this, I'm not suggesting that his trace is entirely absent from the local record. References to his term in office during the critical moment of World War II are often made and invariably the reference are to the radical mayor of Port of Spain, Putnam, the radical Tito Achang, Neptune, or Dr. Tito Achang, champion of the downtrodden, Trevor Millet. But precisely because of these graphic, adjectivally distinct descriptions that are almost always reserved for him, the absence of any further, more substantial attempts to identify his place and significance in modern Trinidadian Caribbean and more broadly anti-imperial and anti-colonial history is startling. Perhaps one possible clue to answering this question is to be found in the radical newspaper MOCO, uh, featured here, one of many journals and broadsheets that appeared in the wake of the 1970 Black Power uprising in now independent Trinidad and Tobago, commonly known as the 1970 Black Power Revolution. In the book review section of the January 26, 1971 issue, Moko's editor, leading historian James Millet, lauded some 27 years after its initial publication and some six years after Achang's death in 1965, the mayor's annual report. The vivid head of the review, Tito P. Achang versus Eric Williams points in the direction of his argument. Not only did Tito wage an unremitting war against colonialism and white power, Millet asserts, but there was a clear and unsevered connection between the colonial state Achang condemned and the bureaucratic post-colonial version of it that Eric Williams had inherited and maintained. Thus, after making the case for Achang's persistent resistance, Millet concludes under the subhead, common ground, that quote, there is one thing common to Achang and to ourselves. We are both confronted with a kind of power and with the abuse of it. Achang saw it clearly. The struggle was a struggle to the death. 
The forces that win are incomparable, are incompatible with subservience. Without a doubt, Millet continues, the book establishes the conti continuity of pro protest against the barbarism of our social system and implies the continuing of the system itself. Finally, it is remarkable how little the society has changed. Tito P. Achon could have been talking about the Williams administration and not a British colonial government. Millet here at minimum draws a sharp distinguishing line between the anti-colonial position of Achong and the post-colonial reality of Eric Williams' regime. Might this distinction also explain Achong's own withdrawal from the front line in the 1950s and his effective sidelining in the nationalist narrative since then? More work must indeed be done to unquestionably come to these conclusions. But Millet in his juxtaposition provides significant grist for this particular nail. Who then was Acha? What was his part that eventually took him to Harvard University before returning home? And where is he to be inserted in the class, racial, and ethnic hierarchy of late colonial Trinidad? Tito Princiliano Achong was born in San Rafael, deep in rural Trinidad in 1884, the year of the Berlin Conference that divided Africa among the European states and heralded, heralded the consolidation of modern imperialism. His father was Chinese and available evidence so far suggests that he came directly from Southern China, possibly in one of the waves of migration to the West that took place in the middle of the 19th century. Chinese immigrants came from, Chinese Im immigrants from the South were almost invariably Hakka, a migratory people who had already internally moved from Northern China. Hakka people had been significantly involved in the 1850 to 64 Taiping Rebellion, then the world's bloodiest civil war to date with over 20 million dead. While many Hakka came to the new world for the typical hope of economic betterment, many were rebels fleeing retribution after losing the war decisively to the Qing government. Was Tito's father a rebel or just an ordinary migrant? There is no information so far to arrive at either conclusion, but it is worthwhile to think of this as one possible element in his formation. Another and far more easily certified was his mother, Maria Emilia Achang, a light-skinned mulatto woman from Martinique. She was a profound influence on all her children. When Maria Emilia complained about the quality of education her five children were receiving at the rural Talparo Roman Catholic Primary School, the nun she spoke with announced to her that her children would not be doctors and lawyers, but mere farmers. So any further education was unnecessary. In sense, she promptly pulled them out of the Roman Catholic school for a non-denominational school and was immediately excommunicated from the church. Achong's deep and abiding distrust of the church and state and the interlinked power elites of colonial Trinidad was almost certainly fostered by these memories, no doubt enforced by stories told of her refusal to accept her place in society and this unprecedented act of resistance. Who was Maria Emilia and what spirit of uncompromising refus refusal did she bring with her from Martinique? There's a hiatus here for which further research is required. But if we might take a leap of faith forward for the moment, somewhere around 1902, at 18 years of age, Tito makes his way to the United States and five years later manages to matriculate into the industrial section of Knoxville College, a now defunct historically black college connected though inevitably segregated under Jim Crow norms from the white University of Tennessee. The industrial school at Knoxville College taught mainly practical skills, but Achong's literary talent was soon identified and he was matriculated into the regular university curriculum. Knoxville, I suggest, not only gave Achong, and you can see him here to the lower left of the picture with his graduation gear on, uh, not only gave Achang a comfortable home and an effective, if traditionally classical education, but it brought him close to the heart of the Black American condition of the early 20th century. 
He soon became a regular writer for the undergraduate newspaper, the Aurora, and a leading and a leader of one of the literary societies that proliferated among the undergrads, Douglas Section A. Writing on a debate in which he himself was a participant, Achong with no sign of self-effacement reports, quote, Messrs. Charles Arnold and T.P. Achong locked horns. The question was, quote, resolved that the federal government ought to protect the Southern Negro in the exercise of the suffrage. In the course of a spirited argument, Mr. Arnold put forth several reasons why it was the duty of the federal government to maintain the status quo of the Negro. The negative, that is action, brushed away the affirmative's action as having no foundation and strutted away bearing the palm of victory." Unquote. By the time of his graduation from Knoxville, Achong had not only become a leader of the literary societies and co-editor of the Aurora, but deeply integrated into African-American student life. While it is difficult to know his outlook before college, it is reasonable to propose that two things certainly evolved in his way of thinking, in his way of thinking while there. The first was his appreciation of and developed opposition to racism. And the second was an appreciation of America, which in the end had given him an education that had been severely restricted or denied in Trinidad. Acham would, for his entire career, always respect and laud a certain US administrative and technical efficiency, which he contrasted with the backward British way of doing things. In 1912, Achong graduated with his baccalaureate in arts and returned soon thereafter to Trinidad. He dove almost immediately into the growing storm of anti-colonial politics, with one of his central interests being opposition to the denominational control of education. In a series of articles in the Port of Spain paper, The Mirror, later republished here in Knoxville student magazine, The Aurora, he lambasted Roman Catholic control over education and its effect in, keep, in keeping people ignorant and suppressing any true search for knowledge under the guise of teaching morals. Achong critically identified the purposes of church control. Quote, to begin with, let me drink a little water so it doesn't go altogether. To begin with, we must first understand what denominationalism means by good morals. Go to church regularly, but never question what is said. Never inquire into the whys and wherefores or the deeds of your rulers. God has put you in their hands, so be obedient. Contribute your taxes at stated times, but it is none of your business to know how the monies are spent. Be satisfied with any position assigned you. Taboo, the lying doctrines of the Mills, Bentham's, Voltaire's, and other infamous strife stirrers and infidels. Eat plenty, sleep well, and wait for eter eternal bliss in the world beyond. Any Trinidadian who agrees to conform to all these with demure is, in the opinion of clericism, a moral man. Denominationalism in Trinidad is an armed camp whose mission is to neutralize our ambition and thwart our aspirations, unquote. Achang's sharp and acerbic style attracted support, but as the Aurora edit editor noted, he, quote, incurred the opposition of the priests, unquote, in his plea for secular education. He very soon realized that in order to have an independent voice and be able to support himself in Trinidad's hostile climate, he would have to leave again and further qualify himself. In 1916, he once again headed north, this time to Boston, where he enrolled in the medical program at Boston University, qualifying as a medical doctor in 1920. After this, he immediately matriculated into the postgraduate program in tropical medicine at Harvard, graduating with his DTM in 1924. By 1926, Dr. Achong had returned home and he was swept into the hurricane of burgeoning labor and anti-colonial politics. The Trinidadian Working Men's Associ Association, led by the enigmatic white Trinidadian Creole A.A. A. Cipriani, had been formed out of the popular upsurge that accompanied the return of black soldiers from the European theater of the First World War. 
Returning soldiers brought with them both an acute sense of racial injustice and an awareness of their own equality and worth, sharpened both by the experience of overt racism in Europe and the awareness of revolt and revolution at the end of the war, and above all, the overwhelming impact of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Achong served for a time as editor of the People, the TWA's organ, and remained an inveterate right and crusader in the 20s and 30s. In 1926, he was elected to the Port of Spain City Council for the first time, was deputy mayor to Cipriani in 1934, and served as mayor of Port of Spain from 1941 to 43. What were Achon's politics? We can clearly identify him as on the left wing of anti-colonial and anti-racist politics in the Caribbean. One of the clearest instances of this was his memorandum to the 1930 to 39 Moyne Commission submitted and read into the proceedings. Achong was not, however, given permission to speak to the commission in person and the file with his submission, submission remained closed until 1970. I use this report to shortcut dozens of articles written in the People, the Standard, the Gazette, the Guardian and other papers between 1926 and 1950, because by itself, it tidily encapsulates his views. Moyne and his team had come to the West Indies in the aftermath of the Antilles wide upheavals that had taken place between 1936 to 38. The protests of the 1930s marked by general strikes, island-wide shutdowns, arson and significant violence directed against the pro protesters were anti-poverty, anti-starvation and against unemployment and demanded the right of labor to organize to form trade unions and fight for better wages and living conditions. Achong's perspective, linking race with colonial control and poverty, was not unique among the writers of this time, but his expression and notably his identifying the local whites and the colonial overseers as Aryans was exceptionally acerbic. To co quote from his submission to mine, unfortunately, there is for the time being a grave cleavage between the people of the land and the Aryan immigrant colony. The protégés of the British colonial office, the latter numbering about 1,500 plus their henchmen not exceeding 2,000 out of a population estimated at 450,000. The primary reason for this cleavage is obvious enough to all indulge with some measure of disinterestedness. The people want economic and social betterment and this they must have. We, the people, have had enough of glorified injustice unconscionable exploitation of colored labor by white capital, lying imperialist propaganda and economic dogmas expedient to monopoly enterprises. Our limit of tolerance has been reached and we are now in duty bound to protest and to make it known that we are not the fools and knaves that propaganda insists that we are. Achong had, de had developed understanding of the political economy of colonialism, leaning toward a class-based Marxist approach, but importantly, incorporating race as a critical factor in social determination. Achong was certainly influenced both in his US sojourn and after by Garveyism and its foregrounding of race, but also retained an understanding of capital as the overarching mechanism guiding imperial exploitation and extraction. In this, his thinking runs parallel to his Trinidadian American academic contemporary, Oliver Cox, and foreshadows the work of Cedric Robinson and Walter Rodney. Again, to quote from the memorandum, quote, in Trinidad, white capital possesses everything of value, naming land, namely land, machinery, forests, natural resources, petroleum, asphalt, and everything else in the earth beneath and in the heaven above. Colored labor owns nothing excepting its undernourished body, who must conduct itself in accordance with the labor catechism of white capital, if it is to receive any sort of casual favor." Unquote. He had an equally developed view on hostility towards the British Empire and the purposes and ends of British imperialism. Note also his subtle connection of British imperialism, imperialist thinking, with extreme German nationalism and Nazism. Quote, as is known, 
the policy of the British colonial office is that non-European populations in the colonial empire, raw material areas, exist for the purpose of providing Great Britain with cheap raw materials. The political, economic, and social advancements of colored labor are no part of the imperial scheme. No amount of sugared hypocrisy will ever mask the bitterness of that pill. Joseph Chamberlain was loud in spreading the news that natives were merely serfs of the colonial estates. Trichke taught his countrymen that colonies were the foundation of the greatness of European countries. Consequently, Hitler wants colonies, naturally. I've been given a five minute call, but I'm gonna st steal a few minutes on the, other end, on the other end. His analysis notably didn't end with just a critique of the colonial system, but developed a detailed set of plans to reform local authorities in order to administer substantial changes in housing, health, hygiene, and water delivery systems all areas that pertain to his own training in tropical medicine and that he had gained experience of in the city council over the previous decade. I'm gonna jump and just give you a quote which ends his, the report. Quote, England is a land of caste and subservience of great wealth centered in the hands of a few and dire poverty of the majority. The men sent here to get, govern us and others licensed to exploit us are recruited largely from the subservient class. As they leave England, they appropriate to themselves great importance, the superiority complex, take pride in their own conceit that the native races are lower than and inferior to themselves and conduct themselves in accordance with their concept. Accordingly, underlying it all is what Lord Morley styled, incendiary of civilization, race, unquote. And then he goes on to say that the only remedy that will at least help in ameliorating our economic dis disability is a wider distribution of political authorities simultaneously with equality of opportunity and education calculated to enhance the earning capacity of the people. One feature of Achan's life that is of distinct interest is his relationship to the Chinese community. I've already mentioned the uncertainty as to the exact trip on which his father came from China and the impetus behind his leaving his home. What is certain, however, is that one stream of his radicalism ran through the 1911 Chinese revolution that ended the last Chinese dynasty, the Qing, and made China a republic. Achang sympathized with and maintained close links with the Port of Spain branch of the Kuomintang and particularly the left wing of the movement led for a time by Sun Yat-sen. He was deeply influenced by the fact that among Sun Yat-sen's closest advisors, many would conclude his closest, was the Trinidadian Chinese lawyer, Eugene Chen, known in China as Chen Yuren. Chen had been responsible for negotiating the hugely important treaties that brought the British concessions in China back under Chinese suzerainty. He maintained close contacts after Sen died with the Chinese Communist Party, particularly Zhu Enlai. Achang's admiration for Chen was evident in his naming his first son, Eugene, who incidentally was born on October 10th, celebrated as the National Day of the Republic of China. Chen, a figure who demands much further research from a Caribbean perspective, was a few years senior to Achang, and like Achang's father, married a Martinican woman of color. Whether Achan corresponded with Chen and the extent of any direct communication is yet to be discovered. But there's no doubt that Chen set an example of what was possible for a Trinidadian to operate on a global scale and to be engaged in a struggle against global capital. And now full disclosure. There's another half to the story that is still to be told and that is that Tito P. Achan was my grandfather. On returning from Harvard and within a year, he married Julia Pena, a young woman from Princess Town, close to the Coca region of central Trinidad and 15 years his junior. The marriage bore eight children of which my mother, second left in the picture here, was the second and first girl and first girl. Karina Achang would do exceptionally well in school and become the first person to win the prestigious Island Scholarship for Girls in 1948. 
One of the continuing questions that remains to be resolved relates both to the style and methods to be used in writing this story. Achong's hidden history must be told, but how can I disentangle it from my own? That's me, by the way, in the center <laughs> foreground. How can I disentangle it from my own? Tito Achong died when I was 12 years old, and I only visited him as a child twice. This is the first visit. I grew up in Jamaica, and by the way, that's him to the right, and his wife, my grandmother, Julia, to his left. I grew up in Jamaica, where my mom settled with my dad, and travel to Trinidad was not cheap, as they struggled to establish themselves as young professionals. So it isn't hard for me to write about him in the third person, and to stick as much as possible to archival evidence, along with the recorded memories of the remaining members of his family and mine, who were still alive, and whom I interviewed when I started this research. Some are actually listening in today. But how much of the, his legacy runs through my own path to radical Caribbean politics as a young person growing up in the 60s and 70s, and how much of him, however frayed, remains in my lifelong interest in the radical Caribbean. It would be a dull and lifeless study to suggest that each generation is built without an inheritance from the past, as it will be bombast and frankly untrue to suggest that his influence was overwhelmingly central in my own story. And my concluding slide. Both the style and me methodology, therefore, and so many other tributaries of this narrative remain as yet unresolved or even unexplored. Among them, I mention a few. What were the critical moments, events, and influences, both in Trinidad and in Knoxville, that led the young Achang along a path of consistent, unwavering anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, and anti-racism. What were the influences that led him to equally laud and praise Yankee know-how as he counterpoised it to British inefficiency? How did Achang resolve his profoundly egalitarian perspectives on race and class with what appears to be more traditional patriarchal notions of the family and the position of males both within it and more broadly in politics generally. How did Ticho imagine himself as someone of Chinese, African, and European heritage? And what effect did this have on his social standing as he lay his bed on the side of the poor? What was Achong's relationship with the burgeoning anti-colonial intellectual movement in Trinidad? Here I am thinking of the group around the Beacon magazine with important figures like Gomes, Mendes and de Boissier, but most notably CLR James. How, if at all, did Achan correspond with James, George Padmore, and other internationally oriented Trinidadian radicals? Finally, as this brief overview started, why is Achan and his mayor's annual report still relatively invisible amidst the rich and deep pantheon of Trinidad and Tobago scholars and activists who fought against British and global imperialism and its racist order. From J.J. Thomas to Arthur Andrew Cipriani, from C.L.R. James and George Padmore to Oliver Cox, from Elmer Francois to e Eric Williams, from Adrian Kola Rienzi to Claudia Jones and Stokely Carmichael. Tito Princiliano Achong is indeed hiding in plain sight. And as a Haitian scholar, Michel Raul Trujillo said in his unforgettable book, silencing the past, each historical narrative renews a claim to the truth. The work to discover Tito's truth continues. Thank you. You can come up to the front and take your questions and those who are listening in from in the cyberspace. Uh, Brian, I, I am so moved by your talk. Uh, I have been researching the Chinese in the Caribbean for a long time, and you have given me a new dimension to think about the Chinese. You know, we think of them mostly as laborers. The common word you hear often is coolies, right? Or the other uh, typical characterization is that they are shopkeepers. But you have a grandfather who was neither a coolie nor a shopkeeper. He was a professional, he was highly educated, and he was uh, not just a political figure, but a radical activist 
no, at a cr critical time. So let's have some questions for Brian, I'm sure, being the person that he is, being the wonderful scholar that he is, and the great teacher that he is. Brian, you welcome all questions, right? Absolutely. <laughs> all questions. <laughs> and if you have any doubts about anything he has shared with us, please bring that forward so we can have a lively and good discussion. Remember, yes, please, and just give us your name. Yeah, as you Erica uh, Durante from Plax. Uh, thanks, Brian, for this uh, lecture. Uh, so during the entire talk, I was asking myself, like, like how did he find Tito Princiliano at home, since you are talking about the statement is hiding from the archive, right? And then, um, and then I understand that you, at the moment, you only covered part of the archival evidence, not the entire archival research. So, my, uh, I will, as I was very curious about this, this was my the question that I was going to ask you, but then you somehow uncovered uh, the secret partly. So, um, I'm asking, like, how did you start, like? Uh, searching, researching this uh, this uh, this life story, and um, and also about the question of like how can you move forward, given the fact that you feel biased by the genealogy that you share with with him. Maybe I was thinking, since you are insisting in this radical uh, Caribbeanism, uh, maybe a way would be, but Professor Udeart can also, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure she also has some some uh, some um, pro proposals in the respect, maybe if you can recreate, you know, this community around him, you were mentioning Eugene Chen mm -hmm. and like a possible um, um, companion somehow, no, uh, for, for, um, for your grandfather, maybe if you recreate this community, this constellation of in radical intellectuals around him, this can also help you to fight against this bias in terms of methodology. I mean, that's all I had to say. Thanks so much. Well, well, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, it's a good question. It's one, as, as you can see in the end, that it's one that I'm aware of, right? And, um, you, know, one, you know, as I said in my conclusion, there could be a study, a very useful study, which excludes, first of all, myself. I, I, I become the third person, I, I become the narrator. Um, but uh, I also suspect that who I am is in a, in a sort of 1,000 miles away and a generation away from him. I'm influenced through my mother indirectly. I'm influenced both in a positive and a negative way uh, in his direction. And uh, that will hopefully come out in the story. But I don't want this to become my story, obviously, because that's deeply egotistic and his story needs to be told. But I, I, can't, I can't pretend that that reality doesn't exist. And also the, 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 the motivation to write, of course, came from um, you know, personal influences. My mother was a big influence who um, would talk about him in the positive and the negative, and who I told ultimately that I was going to write this and never started. My wife, who's here as well, was another influence on me, asking, you know, saying, when, when are you going to do this Tito study? Um, so there, there are these pressures that are coming from, from home, so to speak. Um, my late mother, she, she died in um, 2013. But um, uh, you're right, uh, the, the sort of double barrel second part of your question relates to how do I construct his relationship in relation to the, his times? And yes, it has to be. I mean, Trinidad is a quite remarkable place. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's, first of all, Trinidad benefits from the fact, and once, I don't know if the word benefit is right, from being a new colony, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, it, it's, it's a backwater of the Spanish empire, which is Spanish give up and turn over to the French who are running away from Martin, Guadeloupe and Haiti. Mm -hmm. and who, who, who therefore become the elite in a place where there really is no developed plantation agriculture. And like the Jamaicas and the Barbados is, and of course, San Domingue itself, which mm -hmm. became Haiti, all, all relatively developed plantation, hierarchical, racially structured. Trinidad has all of these openings and cracks because it develops late. It's a 19th century colony. Doesn't mean it's not oppressive, it's not exploitative, but it has a different, it has more, it has more, openings for, for figures like 
Achang to emerge, mm. for figures like CLR James mm. to emerge. Mm. There are a whole set of people across a range of, of third world radical thinking and activism who come out of this, this um, late British colony because of its lateness, because it, mm. it isn't sutured in the way in which uh, others have been sutured over two centuries of, of British domination. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he's one of them, right? But he's, he's missing from the story. He's, 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 he's hiding in plain sight. He's there, but he's not there. Yeah. And so therefore, it's how do you bring him to the service? What are the techniques you use? And also, um, of course, I mean, there are just some ordinary things like, like digging in the archive. And this summer I was in both in Trinidad and in the British archives, digging and coming up with gems. Um, Patsy was with me and you know, every now and then I'd, I'd, I'd call from Trinidad or we were together in Britain and said, I found this, I found that, because there are all of these things that are there but haven't been fully uncovered. The other thing is, uh, I have made this point in the early part, there's so many people um, who mention Tito Acha mm -hmm. because his book is there, but they mention him in a glancing way. But they, in, every time they mention him, they, they use the, the, the radical adjective. In, I mean, you know, it's almost as though they will say, yeah, so there's CLR James, and then there's a radical Tito Acha and say, whoa. So they've attached radical to, to Achang and left it off of James. It's that kind of juxtaposition which I'm seeing. So, so after a while, I, you know, I begin to say, who is this guy? You know, and when you read the, the, the text that I've given you, it's very clear that he had a well-defined position, mm -hmm. very well-defined and, 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 um, um, and, and spoke with a degree of authoritativeness, which, which demands further work be done on him. Mm -hmm. that, that kind of went around your question. Yeah. But <laughs> Very good. You really opened up Erica more space for discussion. Anybody else? Yes, uh, please do. Stand up and introduce yourself, please. Uh -huh. um, this is a curiosity um, based on your bonds with Ashon. Do you have access to his will or to his library catalog? Good question. Mm -hmm. A good archival question. First yeah. of all, he didn't have a will, to my knowledge, or or to let, let me not say let, Aunt Lilia is is on the other side of this, and she's going to tell me no brand or wrong. Mm -hmm. Achang was not a materialist. Mm -hmm. He may have been an analyst of materialism, but he was not a materialist. And he didn't leave much behind for his children. There was some, there was some, something left behind, but it wasn't much. Um, and, and there is no will that I have come across. Um, he also, I've managed over time to accumulate a lot of documents that he left with his eldest son, now also past family in, in, Trin, in, in um, Trinidad. But, I know there are gaps that I'm gonna to have to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason I'm not rushing this to get out, you know, I'm not trying to rush to get out a bestseller, right? I'm t I, I don't need to rush to get out a, be a bestseller. I need to massage this mm -hmm. and to find the missing spaces as best as I can. But I'm not there yet. And this is, this is a classical work in progress. Um, you know, not quite early days, but certainly not late days either. What that continues, mm -hmm. but what you're, you're, you know, all of those things. He did not have a library mm -hmm. that I could have inherited. I've not found it. Mm -hmm. What I do have is a copy of his mayor's annual report, which I showed you, mm -hmm. which which is a remarkable document in its own right. Mm -hmm. I know I have, you know, lots of newspaper clippings that I've been collecting, lots of um, pamphlets that he produced mm -hmm. um, on various topics like housing and health, etc. So, Aluta, continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I thought there was a, is there somebody in my, I don't see anybody in the chat. If yeah. Q&A box, there are seven questions right now. Oh, but it's not in my chat, Kate. In the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. 
Do you want to do you want to just audio setting? Is that where it is? I'm sorry. Tell me where I can see the questions. See, I look in the chat. Oh, this chat. Oh, she's not on. I don't see it. Sorry. Okay, maybe if you see it, you can read it out loud. Sure. I will. So the first, um, it's not really a question. It says, congratulations, Brian. That's from Rhoda uh, uh, Reddick. Rhoda. Um, <laughs> uh, and then. Rhoda is a leading Trinidadian um, feminist mm. historian. And she does also have a question. It says, I've been waiting on this for some time and it is up to your usual standards. This is very important work. Are you aware of any link between Achang and Oliver C. Cox? Thanks, Rhoda, for the question. I, I have not established any links, but what kept coming back to me on uh, reading a lot of his articles, and of course this, the, the mayor's annual report, is the similarity with Cox and the way his assessment ran, ran parallel to Cox's own. Uh, Cox, um, of, of course, um, was an American, professor of Trinidadian origin, whose work on racial capitalism foreshadows um, Robinson, foreshadows mm -hmm. C.L.R. James, mm -hmm. or is parallel with C.L.R. James in, in, mm -hmm. in many respects, and who is now, only now coming into his own uh, in, in, the, in the 21st century. Um, but there, you know, perhaps this was obvious to, 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 to smart thinking people that there was this connection. But it wasn't often made, it wasn't always made. And um, I, but I don't know of any direct connection. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a question from Bridget Brereton. Oh, Bridget. Uh, she said, uh, I, I, I need to tell the audience here. Bridget <laughs> is perhaps the foremost authority on, uh, tr on Trinidad history in the 19th century at the turn of the century. Please let me hear what Bridget says. Uh, it says, thank you, Brian. Can you speak to TA's relationship with Rienzi and the organizations he led between 1938 and 1944? Mm -hmm. Achong, I have not yet found the connections with Rienzi, Bridget. And if you have them, please let me know what you have. Um, the two of them operated in the same place and in many respects, their perspectives were similar. I do know this, that um, Tito was loyal to Butler. Um, Tubal Uriah Butler, who was the leader of the 1937 uprising, but who broke with the oilfield workers trade union with which Rienzi was associated. Tito never engaged in the polemics against the OWTU that, that um, Butler did, but he was Butler's doctor mm. and his, his confidant in this period. So there is a possibility that there was friction with Adrian Cola Rienzi, who was a, um, a leading figure in the Oilfield Workers Trade Union and a leading figure in Trinidadian. Uh, modern working class history, but I don't have the link. Um, the, as I say, the research continues. But mm -hmm. thanks for that, Bridget. And if you know anything, let me know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yes, can you ahead. continue? Because I sure. I, I just wanted to make sure everyone here was all set. Um, this is from Anya Lewis Meeks. Thanks for this engaging introduction to this exciting new book project. Are there literary techniques being drawn to separate the historical research from the more autobiographical moments? Mm -hmm. Perhaps a change from third to first person point of view, separation of the narrator from the Brian character, et cetera. It's such an interesting, unique problem to have, and I'm curious as to how this may be navigated. Okay, first of all, since I've been introducing everybody so far, <laughs> that's that's my my dear daughter, Anya Louise Mix, who is a graduate student in English at Duke uh -huh. University. <laughs> Thus the question. Um, and Anya, all I can say is thank you so much for that question. We will have long discussions over the winter break. <laughs> oh. 
a private discussion. Absolutely. We're not going to be part of it unless you invite <laughs> us to your home for the winter. Yeah, but, but, but it is, let me say this to her, that it is definitely an approach which I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. And thanks for, for putting it in, in that more technically correct way than my adult thoughts. Um, this is from W. Harding. Thank you for offering this presentation to recenter Tito Achong's personal, political, and intellectual interventions in wartime Trinidad. I wanted to ask more about his time in Knoxville. In your research, were you able to get an understanding of who were his fellow student interlocutors at Knoxville? How did they shape his ideas on race and or anti-colonialism and how did he shape theirs? Uh, first of all, W. Harding is my dear, no graduated Brown uh, PhD student uh, who, is, who is now a graduate of Brown actually, uh, Warren Harding. Thank you, Warren. Um, working dutifully on that link. Mm -hmm. I do have significant material already, um, particularly from the Aurora, the Knoxville newspaper, really a first class mm -hmm. piece of student journalism coming out of this black college at the turn of first years of the 20th century. Um, but I have to visit um, Knoxville, mm -hmm. um, the city um, where, where the archives are, and that's part of my agenda. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Warren. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any other comments here? Yes. Yeah, I, have Brian, I have another question, which is about um, wait, which is about the um, the Catholic community in Trinidad, because you said that he, he was uh, really anti-clerical, anti-Catholic, although he has a very you know Latin imperialistic name, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the pro what was the proportion at the time of Catholic? Um, yeah. people in, in Trinidad and also any relations you're aware of with Fanon because they have, they have there are a lot of similarities also by the medical profession and other things just to you know. okay I can answer the, the Fanon part more easily no mm -hmm. we're talking about slightly different periods and of course Fanon goes off to France and um, and then to Algeria laterally and so forth but um, it's it's a good thought to develop um, his mother is what I'm interested in, who came from Martinique. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the feeling here of a, of a, of a strain of anti-racist, anti-colonial um, thinking that's coming through his mother mm -hmm. and who has been silenced, you know. You know, it's always the men who have something to say. But she's the one who pulled them out of school mm -hmm. and said, you're not going back there. Mm -hmm. And was willing to be excommunicated. I mean, that's a big deal for a Catholic. Mm -hmm. Um, the Catholics were a significant component of what you would call the Creole Trinidad population. Mm -hmm. That is the, the non-Indian population um, and were for a significant amount of time, the, ma the majority formal religion, but, but the Trinidadian Creole population that is black as well as um, the white and uh, mixed race population were always roughly, you know, varying in the 19th century from two thirds to a half to maybe less than a half of the total population mm -hmm. as, as things move along. And, and you know, when I hear people like Bridget Burton on the line, I'm, I'm just bouncing off these fractions badly. But um, yeah, um, so always a significant part of Trinidad. Having a far more profound hold though, because of the, of, of, of the Spanish then French connection, mm -hmm. And of course, the French connection was the, the sort of planter arist aristocratic Catholics who came. And so he was very much opposed, opposed to that. He himself was not religious. Mm -hmm. I think that, that is pretty apparent from what he has said and also from his general perspective. But I can say that his wife was mm -hmm. very course, much so. Yeah, Martinique was part of the French Caribbean. Absolutely. So but, there's that French colonial heritage. Precisely, precisely. Yeah. You know, if I may, uh, Brian, um, you know, I, I, I was very moved by the end of your talk when you say, uh, I want to disclose, this is my grandfather. And then you asked, what, what do I have to do with this grandfather? What is my direct inheritance? And I see it in your work. I mean, if you, if your, your whole life's work is about 
Caribbean radicalism, anti-colonialism, your forthcoming book, don't you see that there is that kind of inheritance? You, you know, the inheritance doesn't have to be direct. He didn't have to write a letter. You don't have to say, acknowledge it. But it seems to me part of who you are has something to do with this grandfather now that you're looking into his work. No, you may not have known that earlier until you started looking into him. His mother thought so. His mother? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thank, sure. Thanks Thanks for that, Evelyn. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine so. And this is what, so part of this, mm -hmm. this process yeah. is a sort of psychoanalytical process <laughs> as well as genealogical process. Yes. How do you transfer um, knowledge, sentiments, passions, when uh, there is no direct connection, there is no, of course, there's no World Wide Web. Um, and, you know, to, to make a tele telephone call yeah, yeah. Uh, from Trinidad to Jamaica at that time yeah. was a fortune. And thirdly, I was only 12 when he yeah, died. So, so, you know, the, the yeah. connection is not, is, 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 it's complicated. It comes through your parents, it comes through hearing bits and pieces. Uh, who knows? Through your mother too, right? yes, as absolutely. In, you know, in, in in small and big ways. But I see another connection. Yeah, yeah. how handsome Brian is, and look at that handsome grandfather. Uh, so I'm just no comment. But I have to say that <laughs> I just I thought the photos. He was so handsome. He was uh, a good looking man when he, he was, was young. He was a good looking yeah. man. But here's the other thing that I'm I'm sure it hasn't escaped him. But it's a common curricula, uh, Caribbean phenomenon that I think merits much more attention. And that's the Afro-Asian connection. I mean, over and over again, we have that Afro-Asian connection, particularly among Jamaicans and Trinidadians. And that is because most of the Chinese immigrants like your uh, Achon's great, great, yeah, yeah, your great grandfather, yeah. Achon's great grandfather coming from South China, Hakas, they were almost all men. Mm -hmm. They were almost all men. And so they readily and formed families with local women who were mostly African or mulatta mm -hmm. women, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that phenomenon, I think, is across the board. So I am going to uh, uh, venture to make a small argument. Do you suppose that our Chinese, our Chinese heritage actually put, might have put him among the radical intellectual field at somewhat of a disadvantage to people. You see what I'm saying? It, that, it, did they question his? It's a good question to ask, and it requires a lot of thought. What, what I can say is that the figure of the Chinese or half Chinese radical yeah. appears intermittently both in Trinidadian history and in literature. Yeah. If you think about, for example, um, V.S. Naipaul's classic Gorillas, yes. right? Yes. Um, you know, one of the protagonists is, is a half Chinese yes. a gorilla. Yes. Um, if you think about, um, uh, you know, people like Alfred Richards, who yeah. was a male port of Spain, like, yeah. and was also half Chinese. Yes. Um, the, the, the half, the, the, first of all, there's a distinction between quote unquote, full Chinese and half Chinese yes. in how they are perceived both within the broader community, but also within the Chinese community, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's, a, there's an important point there to be made, yeah. which requires further work. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of work to go on, but there is a recurring figure of the Chinese radical and perhaps the, the, the half Chinese or full Chinese radical is a liminal figure in Trinidadian society that doesn't necessarily fit into the yes. established, particularly in the early part of the 20th mm -hmm. century, in mm -hmm. the established cohorts, and therefore can slip through, yes. right? And therefore yes. ends up um, sometimes, uh, in some instances, as on the side of the wealthy and the rich and mm -hmm. the conservatives, mm -hmm. but sometimes, and, and frequently so, on the side of the majority. Mm -hmm. uh, and Achang is a classic case. Yes. So I don't think he's necessarily um, totally unique in this respect, but it's an interesting point to be made. Well, uh, this half Chinese, half Black Caribbean, the Afro-Asian Caribbean itself, 
is 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 so unique in in the Caribbean. You don't find it anywhere else in the world. Uh, 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 so intensely and so widespread. And, oh, if I may interrupt, yeah. Cuba. Yes, Cuba. Wilfredo Lam, well, for Fredo example, Lam is the other. Is another example. Exactly. It exactly. fits into that exactly. continuum. Yeah. But but I, I yeah, can sorry, even go, go across the Pacific. Uh, the great uh, independence leader of the Philippines at the end of the 19th century is called Jose Vizal. He's a contemporary of Jose Marti. Mm -hmm. Vizal was also uh, had a Chinese grandfather, but he insisted that he was Filipino because as an independence leader, he didn't want to be characterized as a foreigner, as somebody who didn't belong. And sometimes I think in the Caribbean that Chinese is always rendered a foreigner, different from how people of African descent are depicted in Latin America, you see, in the Caribbean. So, uh, it, it, it's worth exploration, yeah. and it's definitely a part of what yeah. I want to do, yeah. um, because it, it was who he was. And um, so therefore the question uh, genuinely arises yes. as to where does he fit in and where does he fit out? Wow, right, but, <laughs> so but, but he, let, uh, just one more thing. Remember, yeah. Brian also told us that he became a close associate and friend with Eugene Chen. And if you want to learn about another extraordinary Trinidadian, it's Eugene Chen, who was a barrister, had a French Caribbean wife, by the way. Martinique, yes, I yeah. did say that. Yeah, yeah. It's, no, his, his wife yeah. came from the same background as Tito's mother. Right. Yeah, from that Caribbean yeah, yeah. Martinique yeah. area. Yeah. 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 But Eugene Chen ended up as Sun Yat-sen's first foreign minister, which is so incredible, right? But why did why did um, Sun Yat-sen want Eugene Chen to serve in his cabinet? Because Eugene Chen, during that period, was a British bar barrister. I mean, it, it was because Eugene Chen's knowledge of the British imperial Absolutely. system that made him valuable. And he could to speak to them in ways in which uh, yeah, other Sun people in the, could not. See? Yeah, that's what I mean. So I think that's a kind of thing we don't recognize about these Caribbean anti-colonialist, because part of Eugene Chen's decision to go in China was, I think, part of the same sort of feeling about independence. No, he saw Precisely. independence in China, so he went there and lent his services. No? Precisely. So anyway, it just, you open up. <laughs> I think you open up a big, big, big yeah. can of worms, shall we say, but a big one. Yes, and one more question, is that it? Yeah, we, we have a bunch of questions. Oh, I'm well, try, going to, I'm going to try and sort of condense them. Why don't you read although, them all out and yeah. then Brian can just start yeah, finishing sure. up, okay? okay. Um, although we're not in a hurry, so take your time because some of these are very rich. So I just want to <laughs> say, go ahead and say that. Sure. Um, so we have a couple of people mentioning sort of more ideas for you. So the right to sit on the Port of Spain City Council was something that Tito mm -hmm. was very much involved in. And that might add something else to your study. That's from Rhoda as well. Yeah. Um, Georgia K. White is saying that there might be a way that oral history could fit into this research. Mm -hmm. Leslie Richards wonders if there is any correspondence with Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. um, and then Rhoda also mentions that as a student of radical Caribbean social thought, it's important that the radicals who stayed home did not gain the global attention that those who migrated did. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one is from Julie Meeks. And she My says, mm -hmm. on behalf of the family listening, thank you for this work and congratulations on the presentation. Excellent to hear from Rhoda, Bridget, and Anya. Mm -hmm. Did you find information on Tito P's brother whom I believe also made it to the US with him on the first trip. Mm. I wonder if there was any influence on his path through his brother. Um, first, let me start with Julie at the end. Hi, Julie. Um, thank you so much for the comments and congratulations. Um, no, I haven't found that. Whatever information you have, please turn over. <laughs> um, and um, you know, this is why the work, the struggle continues, yeah. the work continues. But um, that's that sounds like a really interesting strand which needs to be picked up, yeah. and which I haven't done yet. Um, Leslie Richards, 
all, most many of these people I know, not all, yeah. um, but hi, Leslie. Um, no, um, what is clear is that he was, there's no question of his language, his style, yeah. um, the way he approaches race is, uh, the, the, it's Garvey's influence, the time he lived yeah. in the South and in the States in general, uh, the first period in the early years, um, early decade, the second period in the 20s. Garveyism is written all over yeah. it. So there's no question about that relationship. But what distinguishes him is his close connection of race with capital, yes. white capital. Um, and the way he does it um, shows um, Marx as much as it shows Garvey. Yeah. And an attempt to find a solution to that sort of eternal dilemma in the history of African American yeah. um, radical movements. Mm -hmm. So he's working in that space, but Gabi is in there nonetheless. Mm -hmm. um, there was, did I miss anything? There? Well, others were just suggestions of what you yeah. might, you know, such as oral history, yeah. which I'm sure you're going to be doing. Absolutely, so. no, oral history. Um, yeah. um, there's not so many orals left. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, you're talking about oral history, you're talking about people who are alive yeah, in that time. Yeah. Um, there's not so much left. One of the aspects of oral history that I've been very careful to, to try to do is to work with his children, my yes. aunts and uncle, who are still were still alive when I started this research a couple of years ago. Um, one uncle, um, Iman, um, uh, Eugene was named after Eugene Chen. Yeah. Iman was named after Iman Valera. Yeah. Oh, um, um, so, <laughs> you know, there's no question about where he was going from, from Ireland. Yeah. But um, Iman passed. Mm -hmm. But I did interview him, have a long interview with him, as I did with Lila um, Puntet, who's my, my um, aunt living in, in Calgary, and Diana Carmichael, my other aunt living yeah. in um, Trinidad. So, um, Peter Payne, my cousin living in Trinidad, who's on, on my grandmother's side of the family mm -hmm. as well. So there are oral interviews from a family perspective, but there's work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, something was said about the city council, the town council. This is absolutely central to the research. Um, mm -hmm. The town council in, in Port of Spain yeah. went back to the Spanish Cabildo mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. uh, inherited that independence and peculiarity of the Cabildo yeah. from the Spanish colonial period yeah. uh, and, and became the center of, of anti-government, quasi-democratic work because it still had a property restriction on the franchise, but it became a place where locals could contest the governor. Mm -hmm. and the absolute crown colony power of the British governor. Mm -hmm. And um, so therefore, if you were mayor of the, of the Port of Spain City Council, you were the most powerful elected figure outside of the colonial power. Mm -hmm. And he was that for a period. Mm -hmm. Well, we could probably go on for a long more time because you, as I said, you've really stimulated us. So thank you very much, Professor Brian Meeks, and we will continue this conversation uh, at another time. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all of you who are listening in from wherever you are. And thank you, Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies. Thank you.